I don't remember numbers and dates very well, but I do remember Executive Order 9066 because we were the very first group to be removed under that executive order. You are about to see the second of three films which have been made to help us size up our enemy, Japan. And I can testify that they are as different from ourselves as any people on this planet. When we evacuated, I was in kindergarten. I was seven years old. I was 22 years old. I grew up in Moses Lake, Washington, which is in central Washington. I didn't learn about it until I got to college. It was not taught in school. My father never talked about it. So at Thanksgiving break, I met my father after dinner and I said, can you tell me about these concentration camps? And he said, you know, what happened to our lives is not your problem. You know, our life as a parent is to give you a good life. And so I was determined to learn everything I could about this story. We had a farm, but my father was not a farmer. And so he worked in Seattle and he commuted to uh, Seattle every day. And, um, but actually my mother was the farmer. We just had, you know, our family life and our parents didn't really um, tune us into what was happening worldwide. We're pretty innocent children back then. But being 22, adult already, I could suffer along with my parents. Evacuation. More than 100,000 men, women, and children, all of Japanese ancestry, removed from their homes in the Pacific Coast state to wartime communities established in out-of-the-way places. It was kind of a shock when the government said they're going to uproot aliens, non-aliens. Who's non-alien? Their evacuation did not imply individual disloyalty, but was ordered to reduce a military hazard at a time when danger of invasion was great. They are not prisoners, they are not internees. They are merely dislocated people, the unwounded casualties of war. They didn't dare say aliens and American citizen. That's not right. So we were all uprooted. Exclusion zones were here in, in, on the west coast of the United States, and in Washington state it was the Columbia River, roughly. So if you're on the east side of the Columbia River, you were not sent to concentration camps or forcibly removed. On the west side, you were. That was something that didn't happen to German Americans. We were at war also with Nazi Germany. The racial prejudice obviously came first. Because we looked like the enemy, we were dangerous. Even the little kids. I don't remember packing anything except that we each got to take a, a, one toy. And, and I didn't remember that until I saw a picture of me holding a doll. And, and my brother had a, a toy tractor, and my sister had this doll, uh, and, the, and my baby sister was just a baby, an infant. And I took my album because I didn't know if I was going to be able to see all my friends again, so I brought my small album. I brought a couple of books that my kindergarten teacher had given me. Uh, before I left, and that's about all I can remember. Japanese custom, you don't challenge or argue with authority. You obey. So we all went quietly. So people thought we were happy we were going. No, we weren't. We just kept our mouths shut. And then when we got to the ferry dock, all my cousins were there. Um, and. And then I saw soldiers with real guns, and I'd never seen that before, and it was kind of exciting. And not only that, when we got to Seattle, we were put on a train, and we'd never been on a train before. The train was already waiting for us there. So we get on the train, and off we went. It was the first time I had ever ridden on a train, and hardly any of the kids in my class had ridden on a train either, so. It really was like a vacation trip, for a child anyway. They never told us where we were going, how long we were going to be gone, or anything. So we're on the train for two nights and three days, 
and the curtains were all down, the black curtains, you know, and the windows. And so we couldn't even enjoy the scenery. It was awful, boring. And then we had to transfer on the bus. As we went along, it got warmer and warmer and warmer. And then I, as I looked out, I thought, oh my goodness, you could see the heat waves. And I said, am I glad I don't live in a place like that? That's where we ended up at, Mojave Desert. Have you heard of Mojave Desert? You've heard of Death Valley? With fence all around, this is the Manzanar. Seven watchtowers and the machine gun pointed in sight. And then as we arrived, the nurses gave us uh, typhoid shots and then they gave us two canvas bags, big one and a smaller one, and said, take this and f go to that straw pile, fill it up, that is your mattress and pillow. Bainbridge was about the first uh, group to, to get there, so there were still a lot of uh, buildings being built. We didn't have tables, chairs, or anything. It was terrible. And then the doors were not the doors like we have now. It was boards slapped together. That was our door. No lock or key or anything. So anybody could come in and out. But there was nothing to take because nobody had anything that was that valuable because, you know, we could only take what we could carry. But we still played things like jacks and marbles and jump rope. We had to entertain ourselves, so playing, learning lots of games, running around, <laughs> uh, and chasing around to all hours of the night. Uh, I think that's what I like the most and remember the most. In case you try to escape under the fence, they could shoot you right off. They're always watching. I heard of a fellow that was shot. Mm -hmm. It didn't kill him, but it left him mentally unbalanced. I did roam away from the barracks, and I, I was walking, and I came to uh, the edge of the uh, barracks, well, I mean the camp, and I could see, bar I walked along the barbed wire, and then I came upon a creek. It sort of cut diagonally through the camp, and um, I was excited because on our farm there was a creek, and I used to play in it. And, and not only that, there were bushes and trees around the creek, which is more like home. And so I ran over there and I was playing in the water and I happened to look up and there was a guard tower with a soldier up at the top walking around with a machine gun. And uh, that scared me and I just ran all the way back to the barracks and I never went back there again. There was a big mess hall so we all ate together, breakfast, lunch and dinner. And some stuff was good and others you didn't feel like eating. I didn't know what was happening. It was at an age where I was learning too, so I didn't have anything else to really fall back upon, you know. If, like if I were in high school or, or in the older grades, then I would think, oh, I'm missing proms, I'm missing all of these things, but I didn't have that background, and it was all new learning for me. When I was having a hard time emotionally and everything, I would tell myself, one day I'm going back to Bainbridge. We have another bulletin here. Japan surrenders. I was very excited to get back home to see some of our old friends and go back into our house, at least we had a place to come back to. I remember that ride home because it's August and we're all sitting in the car. But I remember seeing the floating bridge and thinking, oh, we're almost home. When we came home, everybody was overjoyed because they allowed us to return to West Coast, you know, so we could come home to our own home.
A lot of it had to do with the newspaper owners. I think you heard about and read about Walt and Millie Woodward who always, you know, talked about what we were doing in camp and who died, who got married and everything like that. So the people on the island were kept up as to what was happening to us. So it was easy to come back to Greenbridge Island. I've always felt welcomed and very comfortable here. So I'm, this is home to me and it's a good home. We were home about a year, not even a year. And the same thing, my mother said, tomorrow I'm going to take you to Seattle to buy school shoes. And I was excited. And so we walked to the shoe department and nobody waited on us. Other customers came and went and went out with their new shoes. And Mama said, let's try J.C. Penney's. And we went to their shoe department and the same thing happened again. And so then I, Mama said, I'm sorry, we'll have to order your shoes from Sears Roebuck again. And so um, we're walking back to the ferry and the man came up behind us and he said, why don't you go back where you came from, you blankly blank Japs? And I'm turning around to say, I'm not a Jap, I'm an American. And Mama grabbed my arm and said, don't talk to him, just ignore him, keep walking. And, and that now see that as a 12 year old or a, almost teen, you want to be accepted and I, that's when it hit me um, that uh, I could be perceived as something other than Americans. Dr. Kitamoto who headed up our organization for a quarter century, he said, the opposite of love is not hate, the opposite of love is fear. Fear is what causes all the other negative emotions. But it's ironic that the president, President Roosevelt, who signed this incredibly unconstitutional executive order, was the first person to say we had nothing to fear but fear itself. The Fifth Amendment so powerfully says no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It's extraordinary liberty we have in America because we're the only constitution that says persons. All the others say citizens. Yeah, I learned that uh, the government can make mistakes. And although we are the land of the free, we are always free. But sometimes people still don't know that this happened. And when the memorial wall was first constructed, and talked about and that, that we had state grants, well, people wrote letters to the editor saying that's something that should be done in Japan. They didn't get that, you know, this is an American memorial, not a Japanese one. And when I moved here, the Interfaith Council wanted to commemorate it. Their idea was to put it at the Winslow Ferry Terminal. And I said, it didn't happen over there. It happened on the other side of the harbor, where we are now. The wall is built on the very place where those 227 people walked to the ferry on March 30th, 1942. The wall itself is 276 feet long. That's one foot for every person who lived here on Bainbridge Island at the start of World War II but it just said 227. So the difference in that 50 or so number is we wanted to honor not just those 227 that had to be forcibly removed and walked to the ferry right past where I'm sitting right now, but all the other people, the people who were arrested by the FBI prior to the forced removal, the people who were serving in the military, the people who actually had a chance to, they had like six days to move, and many of them ironically moved to Moses Lake where I grew up. So, but every person was forbidden to remain, so it wasn't just the people that walked here. Everybody had to leave. Our place is called Nidoto Nayoni. Our motto is let it not happen again. And we certainly want to honor the people, but the biggest important thing is hope. And Nidoto Nayoni is a message of hope. And we also have five images that tell their story of immigration establishment, of being forcibly removed, and then having to return. So we wanted to build this place, and I call it the place of four H's, history, honor, healing, and hope. And that's what we tried to accomplish here with this site. This airplane that ran into the Pentagon, it happened within the hour from the two planes. On September 11, 2001, that was when we had this attack by terrorists who hit the Trade Center and the Pentagon. When 9 11 happened right away, I was afraid. I mean, I felt that. But it just took a split second, and I thought, oh, no, that's exactly what they thought of Japanese. The common phrase you heard was, this was our generation's Pearl Harbor. And I think what they meant was that was something that will sear in your memory, you'll remember it. But the first thing that went through my mind, as I certainly hope not, because I know what happened in December 7, 41, where they let war hysteria and fear and racial prejudice just take over emotions. Um, but the one time I cried on that day 
was when um, King TV went, we're going to go live to the mosque in, in North Seattle. And I, I worried. I said, what's happened there? I mean, I, all these terrible thoughts went through my mind because people are crazy when they're fearful. Instead, what we saw was an image of all these people surrounding the Church Council of Greater Seattle and the Interfaith Council of, of King County and all the lay people, all these Christians and, and Buddhists and, and Jews and Mormons and all these other people came surrounding this place of worship and they, they, they were there 24 hours a day for days protecting this building, literally protecting this building with their lives. To me that was really patriotic and very powerful. Things do change. The world has gotten smaller, but at the same time, we're still not seeing people of different ethnicities. And I think people should be proud of what they are and what you know their culture brings them. Because to me, the difference is when you get to know each other, you forget the backgrounds of it. When you become friends with people, you overlook, even if they do dumb things, you accept that. And, I mean, you forgive them things because they're your friends. And, and, uh, and I think the more people know each other, you don't notice that because we all have something to offer. Mm -hmm.